Oh, you can definitely swear. I swear all the time. My my sister gets mad at me and yells and calls me as she's listening. She's like, I can't put your podcast on when the kids are in the car because you swear too much. Why do you, she like curses me? But no, we can swear, especially today episode like this. Today is the day to swear. But thank you. Um, thank you to both of you. Um, this is I'm excited for this episode. Thank you, Abud, for putting me in touch with Rana. Um, I this is a somber occasion. Obviously, we're six months into this genocide, but I'm uh, I'm excited to have you guys to to come on and talk about a really important figure, uh, the martyrdom of Walid Daka. Um, he this is not this is like a this is a four decade long story in the works for the Zionist for the Zionist murder machine in a way, um, and his and his wider story sort of I think opens up something bigger on to like a larger sort of historical vista of the Israeli sort of incar like the Zionist incarceration machine and how it operates and what role it plays in um you know the Zionist occupation of Palestine. But before we get to that, Abu, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit. You people know you from the show already, but if they may have missed your episode, maybe to introduce us and tell us a little bit about your work and your affiliation. Well, I'm uh, uh, thanks, Sina, for having us, and uh, I'm happy and glad to join you again. Um, well, my name is Abdul Jawad Omar, and as you called me, like my nickname is Abud. I'm affiliated with Berzeit. I'm a PhD student there, and I also teach part time at the uh, Philosophy and Cultural Studies Department. And my work revolves mostly around the history and making of Palestinian resistance, specifically in in between the first intifada and the second intifada, uh, but more wider on the question of resistance on a theoretical level and how we can theorize it in the context of Palestine. So that's that's mostly where my work, at least at this point in my life, uh, is focused on. And uh, Rana, if you can introduce yourself, this is your first time on the show, first of many, I hope. Um, yes, thank you. I wanna also thank you for having me. I want to thank Aboud for um, letting me join him in this conversation as well um, and inviting me into this space. My name is Rana Barakat. I teach um, in several departments, but mainly in the history department at Beers State University. Um, my work goes back to most, I'm a historian and I work on the Mandate era and um, my forthcoming book is sort of just trying to think about the notion of ongoing return in the midst of the ongoing Nekba, which is a conversation between indigenous studies and Palestine studies, focusing on the village of Lifta and my grandmother's voice, Arifa. Um, so I guess at the outset, we can one of you sort of give us a brief introduction if you haven't heard, for anyone who hasn't heard of Walid Daka, maybe Rana, you can start. Oh, <laughs> this is a this is a Herculean task, actually. So, um, Walid Dakka was born in 1961 in the village of Bak el Gharbiya in central Palestine. He finished high school in 1979 um, and joined the revolution shortly thereafter in joining the PLO. Um, he was captured um, in 1986 and was sentenced, he was captured um, by the Israeli military, um, incarcerated and sentenced in 1987 by a military court um, for a life sentence. In 2012, his sentence was fixed at 37 years. Um, he was supposed to be released on the 24th of March in 2023. However, the military courts kept adding years to his confinement. Um, extending the date of his release to March 24th, 2025. And he passed this past week on April 7th, um, less than a year before he was to be released. Walid is a, he's not only a, or was, it's, it's weird to talk about him in the past tense. Um, he was not only a freedom fighter, but he sort of represented what it means to be a thinker and a fighter thinking through a praxis of understanding repression and oppression and trying to forge a path, a practice and a praxis of liberation um, as he theorized and embodied Palestinian resistance. 
Um, I guess, I guess my the first sort of thought I had, and maybe Abud, you can you can sort of start with this, but like it's it's there's so much violence against Palestinians, like so many martyrs, and this is like a martyrdom. They killed him, and like it wasn't like like we say like died in prison, but really they killed him. They kept him long enough, tortured him to death through medical neglect and killed him. So this is like clear cut case of extrajudicial murder. And, but like, so there's like a, this kind of weird problem though, in moments like this is that amidst so much death, like there's, there are individual cases that require us to take pause and like study and learn from. And it's like, um, and it's not because like their lives sort of mattered more or they like mean more to the world or history or something like that. But is that for people who might not know the struggle, this is a case study in the sort of, you know, Zionist conquest or, you know, ongoing conquest of Palestine. So maybe Abu, if you can kind of widen the scope a little bit and then we can actually delve into his work because he was a prolific writer and a sort of important figure for Palestinian National Liberation Movement? Well, I think, look, my, my own um, uh, look at these things is that, yes, there's always a, a, a space to speak of collective struggles, collective goals, uh, collective praxis, and also forms of collective repression that befalls a lot of different people. But within each movement and each struggle, there's always like a uh, unique, uh, individuals and perhaps every every person in his own right is a unique individual in that sense everybody is a philosopher everybody's an intellectual everybody is a has an opinion about the world around them um, but there are those that can also as Rana mentioned articulate both in terms of what they embody but also through their uh, capacity to articulate uh, new pathways for thinking. And in, in fact, for me, I mean, I I first came to read Walid in 2011, and I read one of his uh, pieces, uh, which revolved around what he called the new uh, techniques of repression that, you know, fits more this postmodern paradigm or what he called liquid modernity, uh, re relying on uh, Zygmunt Bauman in his Molding the Consciousness piece. And as a young person reading his work, uh, it struck me as something new, as something that, you know, uh, fresh, as a fresh breeze of intellectual take on the Palestinian struggle, on the forms of politicized politicide that Palestinians are facing and then how prison itself embodies uh, a story that can tell us something about the larger Palestinian story. Um, so in that way, I mean, it's, it's one of these texts that when you encounter, it kind of like changes something about how you think your own world and your relationship to it. And I think Walid was capable of doing that, whether in his, um, intellectual output, political articles, or in his literary work that came later uh, throughout his uh, uh, intellectual output that has been uh, uh, central uh, to understanding the experience of prison, but also, um, you know, uh, the buildup of a new language around the Palestinian struggle more broadly. Um, I think I would push back against thinking about Walid person and his um, output, as, as Abu just mentioned, as a case study. I think it's, as Abu was just saying, he was, he was offering a space to think. And in the piece that um, Abu mentioned, um, Consciousness Molded, that um, was published in 2010, I believe, he really did offer sort of thinking aloud where he mentioned that this is a quote from him, the most post potent we weapon of the oppressor is the, mind, is the mind of the oppressed. And so he was both historicizing Palestinian consciousness, um, but he was also helping us think about the different technologies of surveillance and repression that were being and are being used by settler, Zionist settler colonialism, both within the small, well, as he described it, within the small prison, um, in in the larger prison. And in that sense, settler colonialism is the large prison. And so there are these two different geographies that represent each other. Um, 
And so I think the writing of Walid over the course of his intellectual journey, um, in the words of Abdul Rahim al Sheikh, it's a, not, and this is a quote the writing of Walid Dukka are not only a rich example of revolutionary poetics, but also a philosophical trial in demonstration of the popular poetics of hope in the heavy presence of hapless official Palestinian politics, particularly in the new century. Walid was helping us find the language, and he said this very um, explicitly in sort of trying to find a language both to understand the different forms um, of repression and surveillance and oppression, but also an understanding it, that understanding that enabling and empowering us to understand how to struggle against and fight those forms of oppression, be it within his, you know, intellectual pieces or his more fictional pieces. He was narrating basically a Palestinian collective struggle. Um, and it's really interesting because incarceration and captivity um, really in what a lot of ways kind of define what Palestinian lives under occupation look like and feel like. So I think if we put, if I can, if we try to think about how Walid in that piece, Consciousness Molded, and the pieces that drew from that thereafter, and his earlier piece um, about, with, which is a really interesting ethnography, um, I think titled The Chronicles of Res Resistance in Janine Camp, where he did an ethnography of prison amongst his fellow prisoners that were fighters in the battle of the camp in 2002. It's us, it's like a, it's a journey in finding a language to explain a political praxis. And so if that's how we frame this, then maybe we can start to think about how Walid Dhaka as a person and as an intellectual and as a poet um, helps us put Palestinian intellectual interventions in the framework and conversation with an abolition and decolonizing framework. So if we think about decolonization and abolition as a kind of dismantling, right? So it's an insurgent practice that goes about dismantling the prison industrial complex, as Ruthie Gilmore describes it, and understanding the carceral logic that frames it. Um, we can understand how Walid's work on and among prisoners in Palestine, political prisoners in Palestine, is a conversation amongst ourselves as Palestinians, but it's also, it offers an intellectual and political framework, both in terms of praxis and practice, of how Palestine and Palestinians getting free can inform that action, you know, that notion of getting free in a more general or global way. So I have, um, I have a quote lined up. That's, I think this is from the article you sent me by um, your colleague um, at Bir Zaid. And it, it's, it's, you know, this, uh, it's, it's a quote. And essentially, it's a quote from Dakhla. The lasting paradox is between our affiliation with the Palestinian people bearing Arab national identity and holding Israeli citizenship, which allows us legally to, quote, stay in our homeland as citizens in a state that defines itself as Jewish. Facing this paradox, we dare to choose our Palestinianism by joining resistance factions in a time when we lacked any rhetorical, political, or even legal statue that could enable us to solve the paradox between our Palestinian nationalism and our Israeli citizenship. Our decision, however, was a was a possible solution was a was a possible individual solution, but never a collective solution for the two million Arab citizens in Israel. Things were confusing and we couldn't reconcile nationalism and citizenship. None of the Arab political parties or forces provided a framework that allows an adequate venue of struggle in which, on the one hand, we maintain our national identity and carry on a national duty, while, on the other hand, we preserve our existence, cultivate our land, and cogently demand our full citizenship. You know, so, so in some ways it seems like, you know, the... What what he's getting at here is like the fundamental, um, the fundamental sort of like illogic of like a Jewish state that like a Jewish state that claims to be, you know, because because like how can you make a state that's any racial ethnicity? How can you make like an ethno state? And so in some ways, Dhaka's like sort of the lesson here is about I don't know like what I'm kind of I'm kind of one I'm kind of between two different views. 
is that like does does Israel's sort of incarceration system does it represent an exception and it's and it's and the sort of citizenship machine that it has which are related I think and or does it represent a kind of like evolution of like the liberal the settler colonial state I know that's a big mess of a question I'm sorry does that make sense uh I mean I'll I'll just jump in and, and and give you some of my thoughts. I think like what we should have mentioned perhaps earlier as well is that Walid, uh, part of his background um, is that he emanates from the Palestinians who remained in 1948 uh, within the confines of what now has come to be called uh, Israel. So he's among the Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, from the triangle area, as as Rana also mentioned, Baq al which is his village. And therefore, he held this kind of like uh, uh, the Israeli citizenship, but at the same time joined or chose to join the Palestinian armed um, uh, factions and was part of a cell that was accused of killing a, a soldier, kidnapping and killing a soldier. Um, and I think here in this quote, he's trying to deal with this tension between at one part, it's a tension that runs across at least the history of Palestinians who remained in Palestine in 1948, which is, you know, this tension between being citizens and at the same time um, having this nationalist uh, affiliation and loyalty and still the, being part of this collective uh, hope for liberation and imagination of uh, Palestine being liberated. And I, th this has been always a highly uh, uh, tense relationship in many ways. What he's pointing out is that uh, there was really no reconciliation between both of these positions. And I think Walid also in his, his articles, specifically his political output, especially those political output that, you know, was directed more towards his fellow Palestinians from 1948 uh, was warning always of a line of flight, if you want, uh, of, you know, increasing and normalization and acceptance of the citizenship paradigm and of what he would term as Israelization of, of some of the Palestinian politics in 1948. So, in, in many ways, he was pointing this paradox and tension, and at the same time, he situates his own decision to join resistance as an individual one that perhaps cannot be applied fully towards the two million Palestinian citizens of Israel. But at the same time, what he was trying uh, at least to get reach of is that does not mean that, you know, uh, people should be uh, sitting comfortably uh, in the other direction, which is the direction of normalization of uh, a state that is ethno-nationalist and at the end wants to confine Palestinians and get rid of them. Um, so, in many ways, this is this is where the quote is is revolving around, and it also speaks to Walid's own history and political development as well uh, throughout his uh, years in prison, moving from membership to the from the PFLP to also joining uh, Al Tajamma, which is uh, the party that was established uh, by Azmi Bshara in 1996. And, you know, being both, you know, having these kind of uh, political um, uh, developments and changes, but still being faithful, again, to what Anna was saying, to thinking through uh, the possibility of hope, to questioning what we may hope for, and to entangle that with issues of practice and praxis that, developed into this uh, highly sophisticated and also enlightening uh, intellectual output that has been coming out of the prison for years. If I, if I could jump in for a second. Go ahead, of course. Yeah, um, I, I think it would be helpful. I, I, um, I should say that I listened to your podcast with Aboud earlier today. I didn't listen to it in real time. So I, I'm sorry that I, I feel the need to rehash because maybe somebody will only watch this one. Um, and I, I apologize for this, but I think it would be helpful uh, to zoom back and sort of see a larger picture here and see the history of the PLO um, and the metamorphosis of that history that happened in this, in, you know, in, in what was called the peace process in Oslo. And I don't want to overemphasize 
the Oslo process or uh, divide, further divide or fragment Palestinian history as a before and after. But it's important to note this, is that, you know, the history of the PLO is a really important part of our history. And in a lot of ways, it's shadowed, the shadow of the current political climate, um, climate under the Palestinian Authority and everything that's happened over the last 20, uh, 10, 20, and 30 years kind of affects how we look back in time. So I think one of the most important parts of this quote is the use of the word wataniya, which is nationalism, and how that has been manipulated um, over time and with, with hands of Palestinians, actually, that, you know, taken on wherever, as Abud was saying in the previous podcast, um, wherever there's colonialism, there's going to be co-optation in the same way that whenever there's colonialism, there will be resistance to it. Um, and so I think it's important for us to sort of think about that, think about what it means that there was a PLO that was first imagined in 1968, 1964, um, the, the, the 1968 iteration of the PLO, which adopted, fully adopted armed struggle, um, and a liberation of the entirety of the Palestinian of the land of Palestine um, and the people of Palestine and their right to return. And then how that over time, both in 1974 and 1988, and then the culmination of that destructive process in, the, in Oslo in 1992 and 1993, kind of just chipped away at that. Um, and again, it's important to sort of think historically about a, you know Palestine in a pre-1948 context, which is how we imagine and live Palestine. Um, it's not historic Palestine, it is Palestine for us. So it's important for us to think about that and how Walid, in what Aboud was saying is the fragmentation of the people of Palestine is something that's happened over time, beginning in 1948 and since in the ongoing Nakba. But it's also this, there is a, there is a continuity um, that is part of a refusal and a, resist, a resistance that was the definition of the revolution at one point, the Palestinian revolution and armed struggle at one point, about Wataniya that wasn't, Wataniya is a kind of nationalism that one can argue wasn't a nation state based nationalism. It's a tenuous argument, but one can try to make that as I do often. Um, and that in it is not in juxtaposition with ethno-nationalism of the, of the settler state of Israel, but rather it is in, it recognizes and diagnoses the ethno-nationalism and fascism of that state from its very inception until now and understands the violence of it um, and offers, a, offers an otherwise way of thinking and being. And so if we, if, we, if we counter citizenship in this quote with nationalism, we see that citizenship offers nothing in, this, in the way that Abud was just describing. And nationalism could potentially, or at one point potentially, this is something we can have a discussion about, is a liberatory practice, or could be, or could have been, or was, or can once again be. But it's important to diagnose what happened after 1968, um, and as I said, in those years, those temporal years, that led to the Oslo process, which was the you know fragmentation of a fragmented people into six geographies. Um, including Palestinians within the Green Line. Can, um, um, can you say the six? Because I'm, I'm, I, I can guess, but I'm going to guess. And let me, let me see if I'm correct. Obviously, there's like pal inside Palestine 48 um, in the Zionist entity. Then there's the West Bank. There's Gaza. I'm guessing Lebanon, Jordan, and the Golan? The Shetat. The Shetat. We call our diaspora Shetat. Yeah. Is there a word? That's just the diaspora, I guess. Yeah, well, I use I I use Shatat because it you know, that's that's part of my work. Shatat is about how we were part of you know the the violence of settler colonialism is is that we were forced into exile and it was a violent process that began in 1947 as a part of the war and what you're seeing right now. I mean, this is we cannot not talk about Gaza, right? So what you're seeing right now is just the ongoing. Um, brutality of that violence. So we use, or I use the word, within, we use the word shatat um, to describe exile, but within that description, it's not, um, 
it's a, it, there's an embedded sense of return and a right of return within that. Um, but I think, I mean, the point that I was trying to make earlier was just that quote that you that you read. Um, it has its particular and very specific dimensions that Abud was talking about within the within the politics of all of these geographies, including the geography of within the green line, but it also has a larger sort of resonance with the question, um, with the provocative question that Palestine offers. Again, it's, it's this idea of how Palestine and Palestinians offer. Is there a kind of sense or sensibility of nationalism? And he uses the word wataniya, um, and in Arabic, watan and qawm. So wataniya is, is nationalism one can describe as a nationalism that doesn't adhere to the boundaries and the borders and the and the capitalist intonations of what a modern nation state is within European colonial modernity versus Gaumia, which is a nation state nationalism, which is kind of a, um, you know, a reflection of that colonial mapping of our part of the world and all parts of the third world. Um, and he's making, I think, the way that I read that is there's a there's a provocative statement there, is that in our wataniya, which is our struggle within the armed struggle and within the revolution, um, that offers us a sense of Palestinianness that we can embody, that is counter. Um, and antithetical in a lot of ways to how citizenship has been molded and described, both for what he describes as the two million Arab citizens of the colonial settler colonial state of Israel, but also in the larger sense of what is the difference between seeking a nation state, i.e. citizenship, or seeking freedom. Um, and they are not one and the same. And I think that's the provocativeness of that statement, is they are not one and the same. And that goes to speak to kind of a resonance of what the PL, what certain people within the PLO, even in the 1960s and early 1970s, and what <laughs> we've seen in the political lack of a horizon over the last 30 years. I mean, I you know, I I I think Rana makes a great. Uh, uh, a great you know intervention here because i think she's exactly pointing out um his you know what it's distaste for you know confiding palestinian demands if you want or goals or palestinianness within this citizenship framework um that you know ends up just building a edifice within much of the politics and the polity of Palestinians in 1948 of rights and particip participation in the public space, which is in this case an ethno-nationalist, uh, racist uh, public space that uh, tends or is built on the idea of excluding uh, the Arab and reformulating him and, and molding him in a way that, you know, uh, kind of good Arab, the good Arab that is loyal to the state, obedient, perhaps has some type of material well-being, but at the end of the day does not have a political uh, 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 voice or personality except what the settler colonial state might offer. Um, and I think, yeah, I think Rana was, you know, did, a, did absolutely, uh, you know, good uh, intervention in terms of outlining also the possibilities of Palestinian nationalism to not just perhaps confine itself um, like other nationalisms in the third world within this kind of, uh, uh, you know, ethno-national state or even the framework of a state itself, that it's a nationalism that transcends perhaps this category in much, uh, in much of its development and uh, the way it serves as a, uh, 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 a counter uh, uh, to you know various forms of uh, hegemony on 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 in the world, including capitalism and and settler colonialism, and also the idea of the state itself um, as the ultimate horizon of policy and liberation. I guess in some ways, um, the there's another sort of aspect to all of this, which is the the one of the sort of Zionist tools of basically sort of the ongoing genocide and i mean not just the one in gaza but i mean the ongoing ethnic cleansing of of palestine um is this use of incarceration can 
can either can each of you sort of take a few minutes and give us for people who don't understand i mean some people obviously who listen to this show i'm sure you know understand the scale of sort of incarceration of our sort of our sort of we talk about it as like you know incarceration but i unless you're like deeply working in like prisons and like going day to day and like tracking them is that it's hard to get a sense of how total like incarceration is and how much like it's a global factor especially i mean i lived in the us for 12 years and yeah there's prisons everywhere but you never see them because they're in these far flung corners not always but you see enough of them to learn that like incarceration means something very basic to this society to its functioning but in the settler colonial context of like zionism which is this kind of always which is this really intensive ongoing war like what what does that machine look like Sure. I think um I think you're you're presenting something that's a really interesting challenge, right? So I can and this is where Walid's helpful. Um he's he's a guide. He's not only helpful, he is very much a guide. So how do we think about the specificities of the enormity of the use of captivity and incarceration within the toolbox of Zionist settler colonialism and how far reaching the tentacles of that machine are and how overwhelming it is a part of Palestinian past and present. And then try to forge a conversation across in a transnational kind of way, across the boundaries and borders of colonial nationalism and colonial nation states towards building a kind of solidarity. So I'll begin with the specificities. The specificities go back actually before the creation of the state of Israel in 1948 and go back um, to the British colonial mandate era. And in the British colonial mandate era, not to, you know, not to, to give too much of a historical lecture, the criminalization of resistance actually began with the very beginning of military occupation. So as soon as the British military occupied and declared Palestine as part of occupied enemy territory, we witness and can observe as historians how the tool of oppression and incarceration were part and parcel of British colonial oppression and then were fed into later on with the state um, and were adopted by the Israeli state, by the settler state of Israel, as part of their own method methods and methodology of oppression. <coughs> so the landscape of prisons that exist in Palestine go back to the British Mandate era. And these prisons actually still exist, right? The, the structures of them still exist materially. And the ethos and mechanism of that power, of that oppressive power, also still exists. That's one really important aspect to understand that settler colonialism everywhere uses this as a tool of, of, of oppression. Zionist settler colonialism uses it as a massive tool of oppression, right? So even in the figures that we have, it's really difficult to have figures from the Mandate era, and the figures that we have were born out of mobilization and movements that came about after 1967 with the prisoners movement. Um, so we can say with actual you know, data that over a million Palestinians over the course of the last um, 76 years of, of, uh, of, of settler colonial violence on our land have been imprisoned. That means one in 15 Palestinians basically. Right. Those levels are unprecedented and really difficult to sort of wrap your brain around. So uh, incarceration in the smaller sense of an of a prison is something that is a constant tool. And right now there's even more any you know, the, the, the audacity of the evil of settler colonial violence is actually constantly on on display since October prisoner. The. Palestinian prisoner society have recorded that over nearly, sorry, nearly 8,000 Palestinians in the West Bank alone have been imprisoned. Think about that. We're thinking, um, what, 180, 190 days, nearly more than six and a half months. And that's how many people have been imprisoned. We have more people right now under administrative detention than even in the height of the second intifada. Um, so these are like, these are numbers that are like what you were saying, the ongoing genocide. This is, it's almost an, you know, 
people theorize and call it a slow death or invisible um, invisible violence. But I think it's I think we just have to think about it in order to make it visible. It's not really all that invisible. So that's one part of this conversation, which is the overwhelming use of, of prison and imprisonment um, in Palestinian to to in sorry in, in settler colonial violence in Palestine. The other part is how we understand that prisons across the globe have functioned in this way. This is what imprisonment has meant. The specificities of where of each particular geography of oppression means that prisons and incarceration have been used in different ways. But there is a, a thread that connects all of this, which is criminalizing our quest and struggle for self-determination, be it in Palestine or elsewhere. And then it's incumbent upon us to do as, as Waleed sort of guides us to do, which is think about how this works in different ways in different places, but how this also ge generates conversations about how refusal and resistance actually work over time as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think, uh, um, I think what Rena was mentioning in terms of, you know, incarceration as a policy of mass confinement of Palestinians and rendering, rendering them in this exclusionary space, which Walid described through time, he called it this peril time, which he contrasts with the social time that stands outside of prison, as a means to also, uh, you know, defeat the political subject within the Palestinian is, is, is part and parcel of the, you know, imprisonment experience in Palestine. And because it targets the wide society, it, it tells us something about how Israeli settler colonialism sees from the outset that the entire Palestinian society is the target. And, and this whole, you know, discussion that is happening today, for instance, in, in, in much of, you know, uh, the intellectual circles in the West or the media about this, uh, you know, uh, Israel now maybe taking its gloves off and not differentiating between, you know, Palestinian armed resistance fighters in Gaza and civilians. It actually tells us that the war on Palestine has always been a war on you know, the Palestinian subject, and it, it targeted the entire society of Palestinians. And one of the biggest manifestations and embodiments of that is this kind of mass confinement that has been a, a you know, a hallmark of Israel's policy and which also what Daqqa himself was, you know, uh, you know, launched into and, and was part of as both a, a, a political leader and an intellectual leader within the prisons themselves. So, I mean, you know, imprisonment takes a lot of different shapes and forms. I mean, Rana was mentioning administrative detention, which is a form of, you know, detaining people without um, any charges against them, without knowing what they're charged of. And as, as, she, put, as she said today, there's more administrative det detainees uh, than ever in, in Palestinian history. Um, there are, you know, people who are prosecuted under a military court system and a military between quotes justice system, which is not really just. It convicts almost 99.6% of all the cases that comes through it. Um, it's a it's a grinder that is you know you're convicted even before you reach uh, the court. Um, in many ways, uh, it's created um, to place and confine people, not to actually find the truth of the matter. And at the heart of it is is this whole uh, criminalization of Palestinian resistance. And not only criminalizing it with, you know, uh, terrorism, uh, which was one of the, the, you know, the most important ideological, you know, let's say uh, slurs that Zionism has used against uh, Palestinians uh, uh, since the beginning of uh, uh, this struggle. Um, you know, um, talking through these terms like terrorism and 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 depriving the Palestinians, even fighters like uh, Walid. Um, who uh, were involved in armed resistance of being, you know, uh, people who are uh, considered, you know, under international treaties, prisoners of war, or even political prisoners and, and attempting this form of, of criminalization. I mean, you know, and there's different sites within the prison, whether it's interrogation, whether it's the various techniques uh, involved in interrogation, uh, a, a site that is used where Palestinians undergo various forms of torture, 
uh, and then also the imprisonment itself, uh, being captured either on checkpoints or captured in, in the house. I mean, it's, it's part of also the power that Israel has, this power of who I will arrest and not arrest, um, aching to this kind of necropolitical power, which is, you know, who to kill and not to kill. Um, it, it, you know, how it sorts people out to arrest them and why it arrests, arrests somebody and doesn't arrest his friend, um, creating a lot of uncertainty around um, who gets arrested, why he gets arrested, and also that's part of it's also a technique of domination and control uh, that have uh, enabled it to sustain um, uh, a large part of its uh, satirical infrastructure expansion uh, within Palestinian uh, uh, life. So yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, in, you know, prison, uh, you know, I think is one of those most important sites in the Palestinian struggle because of its massive magnitude, because every family in Palestine has been or knows somebody or have been touched personally by, you know, imprisonment. It's, it, 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 it touches everybody's lives um, um, in many ways, and it's a part and parcel of the Palestinian uh, political experience. Yeah, if I could just add, I think, you know, I think it's important for us to think about how as important as what Abud was just saying with the level of kind of the level of control and power that is enacted both within the prison and the stages that get our political prisoners into those prisons the hunting and the captivity of it is that this is also it's a, it's it's also representative of what living under occupation is right so that's the point of small prison and large prison and large prison is all palestinians are prisoners that is what settler colonial violence is on the land of palestine it, it the iterations of that power differ over different geographies and over time but the, the notion and the act and the actions of captivity and confinement are what is Zionist settler colonialism. So we see this in the different geographies, in the West Bank and how we can't right now get, it's how difficult it is to get from one city to another, the way that the land is marked, the way that fear is a constant technique of control. We see this on display, on utter display in Gaza with the kind of, um, the spectacle of incarceration that happened both when Gaza was under siege and over the course of the last six months in the prisoners of war and how those images are actually put out. We are made to consume these images of control and degradation and dehumanization. So that's, I mean, that speaks to the kind of, that is what settler colonial power is. And I think that's what Walid was trying to explain in terms of the small prison and the large prison. So if you see techniques of control in the small prison, i.e. the prisons themselves, we get a sense of what settler colonial violence is writ large in the entirety of the geographies of Palestine. So I, I have this quote that might be of... Um... It might be of value. It's from the your your colleague's article, Al Sheikh's article. I'll I'll link to it in the final piece. Um, but this is uh, this is about. It's an interesting line. I'm going to learn. I'm sorry. I was kind of reading it on the screen. I'm going to read it better now. Do a better job reading it. But there's a quote. This is this, this is the author of the article writing. Negating the pretense of being the scholar, Daka describes the metamorphosis of prisoners of the of prisoners' positionality in captivity declaring that his quote, and this is Daka writing, political per principal purpose is to explain that what happens in the smaller prisons is not just detention and isolation of people considered to be a security risk for Israel, but is a part of a general scientifically planned and calculated scheme for remolding Palestinian consciousness. That's the end of Daka's quote. So that, and um, uh, then now back to the author, Al-Sheikh, Israeli prisons do not resemble prisons in the West, in the West or in the rest of the world, for the aim is not the body of the prisoner, but rather his soul, senses, and consciousness. For the enemy aspires, quote, and this is Daka writing, to remold humans according to an Israeli vision, especially the fighting avant-garde locked in prison. So this this was to me like something really 
his term about, about molding consciousness. I should, I should keep going. His term about molding consciousness. Molding, this is the author again, al Sheikh. Molding consciousness, a term coined by Moshe Alon, former Israeli war minister during Al Aqsa Intifada, refers to a master plan Israel crafted to devour Palestinians by attaining absolute control over them. What Israel failed to achieve through material means and policies inspired by apartheid South African regime is now underway in Palestine, where racism ceases to be, quote, popular, spontaneous, and illogical phenomenon, end quote, and becomes organized racism, initiated by the Israel, entire Israeli establishment with its logic, legal, and moral justification. So that, this, is, it, this was like a real uh, sort of eye-opener to me um, the, in, 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 a, in, a, in a simplified way. Is that this the, that the scientific nature of Israeli like what can only really be called like race war because it is ultimately like a racial state fantasy that operates under Zionism of oh a pure Jewish land cleansed of these dirty indigenous people and so like this and so like the ultimate horizon is is the inside of the heads of the Palestinians themselves it seems. That like if we can't break your bodies, we'll break your spirits, and we have various tools at our disposal, and including outright genocide when you really don't give up. Like let that be a lesson for you. And I think in some ways when people are like, oh my god, how can they record themselves doing their crimes? It's like they do the crimes so they can record it, so they can record it at, like at a point, right? Like at a, at a kind of element of all this is that the proud. Like the proud, the, like doing violence to Palestinians proudly is part of this like nonstop like psychological war. And so, in some ways, like 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 forcing Walid Daka to die in prison of cancer slowly, torturing him to death, which is like what they did, is like obviously like a message to the rest of you that like this is what awaits you if you choose to resist us. Uh, I'll, I'll 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 jump in. I think look. In many ways, Sina, you know, the you know the idea of searing or molding the consciousness um, is is has been you know part of parcel. I mean, look, there, there to me, first of all, this is this is a is a notion or a concept devised by Moshe Alon in the height of the Aqsa Intifada. Again. Like it points out to two things at the same time. There's first of all a hyperinflation in Zionist terminology about how it views and articulates the war against Palestinians. Why I say a hyperinflation? Because uh, at some point it's a, it's a war over land, at others it's a it's a war over the consciousness of the Palestinians. Um, but in essence, what what Moshe Alon was trying to point out is that. If this Zionist settler colonial project is to succeed, this indigenous population need to first of all legitimate the state of Israel by, you know, recognizing it, and at the same time give up any hope for uh, their own political uh, voice to be heard, their own political subjectivity to manifest or embody itself. And third of all, you know, and and that's what's ha been happening in Gaza. They need to disappear. And, and that's part of also, if you want, the prison. Uh, you know, prison is also about disappearing people, um, excluding them from social time, as Daka would say. Um, you know, placing them in this parallel time where they're deprived from light, where their body is ex extracted among from among their family and friends, and placed in another dimension where time passes in a different uh, manner and way, and. When we're talking about molding the consciousness in this context, what you know, Walid was doing in this specific article, which was uh, also what Rana was trying to hint at, which is how can Walid, through his dissection of the techniques, tactics, and flow of time and space and confinement in prison, articulate a wider point about the larger prison in which all Palestinians live, uh, the ghettoized Bantustans in the West Bank, uh, the people who live in Gaza, you know, under conditions of deprivation uh, and siege. Um, how can we understand how 
you know, the target in essence is, you know, uh, the political subjectivity of the Palestinians itself. And in that article, he talks about politicide, uh, you know, genociding, if you want, the political subject of the Palestinians, remolding his consciousness so that he would accept servitude, uh, uh, being just uh, an economic subject or uh, becoming sort of a cooperative um, uh, a, a person that would be willing to cooperate with his own uh, self-effacement um, as has been happening at least on some level uh, with the current Palestinian authority. Um, so, I mean, he was trying to explain how, how in many ways part of that policy of molding the consciousness sometimes is successful because it does create from among um, the political leaders, the people who are actually dressed up in this sort of pseudo-nationalism, it creates a cooperative class because if their consciousness is, mel- is molded, if their own sense of how they view reality is that we're defeated and that defeat is uh, eternal and that uh, there's no hope of you know uh, finding a path or a horizon towards liberation, then the, the avant-garde, the, those that are supposed to be the leaders of the Palestinian people can become the ones that betray the Palestinian people in many ways and can actually betray the nation in the name of the nation. Um, and in, in, in many ways, he was directing our eyes at that process, which he also saw somewhat unfolding in, in some of the prisons among some of the people. And I don't want to overemphasize that. I don't think this is necessarily... Uh, you know, the, the, the more collective phenomenon, but as we talked about it earlier, there are always those who cooperate and those who resist under, you know, uh, settler colonialism. But what is also needs to be explained how some of the people who took the mantle of resistance uh, became, uh, in many ways, those who cooperate with settler colonialism, that kind of uh, crossing the line between resistance and towards uh, cooperation. So Walid was also trying to warn us of of that possibility, uh, which is, uh, in many ways, an existing uh, reality in the West Bank, at least. I completely agree. I think if if we look at what Walid was writing in Molding Consciousness, um, it's echoed in, in his writings thereafter. He introduces all of these concepts in this really short piece. Um, it's like a booklet. It's not quite any the length of a book. Um, But in the introduction of it, he goes on to sort of extrapolate other things or certain concepts over time. And it shows you how concepts can change over time, right? So in this quote, what, and there's three things that I'd like to just add to what um, Abu just offered us, which is he is giving us this notion of controlling time. Right. And so we know that we, we understand those of us who understand who, who are working to understand what settler colonial violence looks like is that one of the one of the aspects, a tool of this violence is forcing those who exist and resist under their rule to sort of cons- conform to this notion of settler time. So it's this play with temporality and that play with temporality is part of the violence of the structure. It's structural violence, right? And therein, Walid gives us this this notion that he goes on later in his career or later in his journey, that is to say, to to offer us something called parallel time versus social time, which is what Abud was just describing as parallel time is this fourth sign of confinement. That's kind of a circular time, but it's outside of time, right? It's outside of social time and it's, it's a form of confinement. But in this, we can sort of see how it's mirrored. Again, it's also mirrored within the larger Palestinian politic. And that mirroring is about this kind of psychological form of torture, which is something that he was writing about in in 2004, in the the height, as Abud was saying, of the Second Intifada and thereafter. Because Zionist logic said that if if you can create cooperation, complicity, um, both pol- you know, within a political structure outside in the larger prison, and that is the structures of the PA, um, and have that mirrored or you know 
or come from the smaller prison, um, you can create a system of control whereby, as Walid, would, as Walid said in this piece, um, we're monitoring ourselves. We've come to control ourselves in the sense of Palestinians are surveilling themselves for the larger project of settler colonialism. And that's what we're seeing in the West Bank right now, right? Um, and this was, this was something that was imagined and constructed. It was, it's something that had been an attempt over time within, within Zionist sort of rooms, war rooms. But it's something that we're witnessing, we witnessed in, this, in the height of the Second Intifada and the post-Second Intifada era. Um, and so he, Walid is writing about psychological torture and what is, you know, in a disciplinary sense called social psychology. Um, and we can see this, we can see that this is, you know, he's writing in a genre that a lot of people, um, a lot of theorists and people and fighters under occupation and colonialism were writing. And we can see Fanon echoed, we can see Cabral echoed here. It's this notion of psychological control that is almost more effective in a, in a colonial context than bodily control. Um, and this is a part of understanding colonialism, part of understanding modern colonialism. That's what he was getting at. Um, he was getting at sort of freeing the mind. And what he was saying is that we have to understand how they're trying to control our minds by controlling temporality and controlling what the political horizon is, as, 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 as Abud was just describing. And understand that we have to release ourselves from that. Um, and that's what he described as Samud on, in captivity. Um, and the third point that I'd like to make here is that the article that you keep quoting from is an article by a colleague of Abud's and I, um, Abdurrahim al-Sheikh. And, and this is, speaks to a Palestinian positionality because um, Abid is someone who has written about Walid, but he's also somebody that was, the past tense is still hard for me, somebody that was or is writing with Walid. Um, and that speaks to a kind of Palestinian positionality of the smaller prison and the larger prison again. They are in conversation, and their conversations generated a lot of work over the last 10 years, over the last decade. Work um, that, that Abid has given us in, in English and in Arabic, and work that Walid has given us in English and in Arabic. And so it's, it's hard to distinguish between the two of them sometimes, but it's, it's important to think about positionality and that we write this isn't an academic setting. It's not even just a scholarly setting. It's a conceptual setting of sort of how writing and thinking is about getting free. And in Palestine, this is also about coveting and nurturing conversations. And so that's what's special about the piece that you keep quote, that you're quoting from. I have. I wanted to. I wanted to read more from it, but I realized that that there. Um, I did have. I did have something else to discuss, which was you know the. I mean they they. The, the totality of Zionist sort of terror from like before you're born to after you're dead and how the necessity of like just stomping on every single symbol of Palestinian humanity. So, of course, what did they do after torturing him to death through medical neglect? They attacked his funeral and the video. I mean, I'm going to play it. It's distressing for people who don't want to hear or or see this so you can just you can um skip through but i mean it just it brought mine it, it initially brought to my mind the scenes of of uh shirin abu akla's funeral but this is a long standing practice of of zionism is to is to like desecrate essentially the body and to like attack mourning itself <laughs> I'm sorry to have uh, to have inflicted that on you. I'm sorry, guys. That was uh, not. I mean, yeah, these things are 
terrible to watch and um but it, it just like like this is like to, to even just say like this is nazi behavior at this point is almost like what do you like is is it even is there even a point to saying that this is not behavior but like the like maybe maybe you got we can turn this into a question though is that like what does it what what is so what is the necessity of attacking like mourning itself i mean there's the obvious thing of just a kill anything that moves kind of approach that c- colonialism has um in a lot of different scenarios but the attack on palestinian death because they also do this thing of like withholding bodies um you know like pe- and then they keep them frozen this was an, something that i heard nader shalhub kavorkian talking about um the asla you know it's kind of like a tool that zionists use that even in death Palestinians are they're tormented. So I, I'm curious, like what is it is it to send is it just to sort of round out the lifetime of torture of this guy? Is it just is it just a symbolic thing? Or do they is it something for their end, for their own police force to have some to go and keep them busy for a day? Is it just is it sport, the Zionist terror machine? Is it all of the above? I mean, I, I was thinking about this and thinking about because Walid's body is now being held. Um, and I was thinking about thinking, finding a language for this. He who wrote about this phenomenon is now embodying it. Um, and thinking about how we found out about his martyrdom. His family, nor no Palestinian officials were informed. It was the Zionist press that put out a release saying that Walid had passed. There is a kind of sadomasochism involved here. And it's reflective in the videos that we're seeing of soldiers finding a kind of sick celebration of blowing people and things up in Gaza, of attacking grief in the same way they attack life. I don't know if I, I don't know, maybe Abu would be more articulate and eloquent than my, than me in this. I don't know if I have a language for this. And to be more honest, I don't know if I want to have a language for this. Because I don't think I want to understand the levels of depravity that put this kind of violence on display. Um, it's a, it is arguably a fascism unknown in history until now. These are, you know, the, a genocide is quite literally being live streamed. Um, and that's not to say that genocides haven't happened elsewhere in other geographies, but the kind of intensity and veracity of the last um, six and a half months has been incomprehensible for me. Um, and this, and this, attacking a funeral means attacking, you know, it's, I guess, you know, if we, it's not a time for theorizing, or I, I'm not capable of theorizing right now. It's just, attacking life, even in attacking the celebration and grief of life lost. I don't know if there's a language for that, but there is certainly, it is, it is, it is Zionist violence on display. I mean, I do, I do agree with Rana. It's, it's sometimes, you know, language has, a, you know, uh, limitations to what it can actually encapsulate. Um, I don't know, like, to me, Sina, I think at some level it shows you also there is a form of sadism involved in this assertion of power. And sometimes power for power's sake, it doesn't have really a lot of rationale behind it. But it always, you know, touched upon the, the sense of insecurity that this form of colonialism has, because it does kind of also recognize that um you know, we Palestinians, we don't die in silence. Our funerals, our celebrations and protests historically, and they remain so. And in many ways, um, they think through this policy of withholding the bodies and preventing the burial and preventing from people gathering face to face that they're, you know, depriving Palestinians from this, uh, you know, uh, refusal to to die in silence i mean um but it also kind of at the same time is revealing about the nature of you know zionism itself as a highly insecure movement and people who you know have 
um, you know, after placing somebody for prison for, you know, uh, more than I think 40 years, um, um, extending his prison sentence based on, you know, hubris, uh, despite him completing his prison sentence. Um, and at the end, withholding the body and imprisoning his corpse, and then attacking any gathering uh, in front of the family's house, um, you know, to at least for people to visit and pay their respects. Um, it just shows you, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a highly insecure power, highly, um, um, I don't know, detestable as well, of course. But, you know, there's something uh, for me that is re reveals, um, you know, a, a conception of power that in Israel and within the Zionist movement thinks that force is the only language. And at the end of the day, force is not power. Um, and I think they they are at some level, um, I, I wouldn't say jealous, but envious of our ability to not die in silence. Um, I don't know why. Uh, perhaps it has to do something with history or otherwise. But there's something in that that they find threatening um, um, on a level that is uh, inconceivable. But again, as, as Rana said, I don't want to like put too much language in attempting to understanding such uh, vile behavior. Just to, 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 be, to, be, to be in conversation with Abu, there's something beautiful that he just said, is that we don't live in silence and we don't die in silence. And I think that's really important. And I think what's important for us to also to read here is that in all of the writings of Walid, and we're going to talk about his his hopefully we're going to talk about his fictional pieces now and his writings to his um, to his to his child, is that there's a sense of what Walid taught us or is teaching us, is that Zionist leaders and Zionism constantly works to come up with new mechanisms of control. And what's important about recognizing that, it just means that they can't control us, right? The new mechanisms of control become more heinous over time. Technology allows them to produce more um, um, brutal ways of killing and silencing and attempting erasure. But the real, um, the real confinement is Zionism. Because however hard they have tried to break our relationality to the land, they haven't. And I think that I don't want to go into a Zionist mentality or understand colonial logics, but I think what this shows is that they know that they cannot. And so these, all of these, as Abu just really eloquently said, power um, forces, forces not power. So they will continue to be relegated to use more and more force because they know they have less and less power. That's, yeah, I, when I heard that, like, my brain was like, oh, that's the one. Um, because in, so, in, in some ways, too, it reminds me of, so remember this meme that goes around every now and then of, um, it was, it was, it's, <laughs> it's so stupid. I live too much time online. But it's a very telling meme. But basically, it's the, uh, the this like after the assassination of Soleimani, there was like a recording that went around from like an Iranian talk show, and it was a caller who was saying like, "What do we do? Who do we hit back? They have they don't have a society of heroes, right? They have a huge population. They haven't they they've been around for a hundred years or something like that, like hundreds of years, but they have no heroes. They have nobody." Like who do we? What are we gonna do? Get Spider Man? Like should we get SpongeBob? Like and it it was a it was a very and it became it became it still it still circulates the meme. I'm gonna circulate it later today, in fact. But it, it reminds me that like something that something that settler colonial countries like settler colonial projects lack, which is like a sense of their own a, a, a sort of organic let's say sense of their own self. Right, is that their condition of being is in contradistinction to the indigenous person, right? And whoever makes up that, and because of like the fundamentally like disunity that ties together Zionism, that as much as they want to say, and I say this a lot, and I'm curious what you guys have to say about this, is like as much as they want to say that Jewishness 
is the tie that binds them is that at the end of the day, they are still a disparate population who came together by ways of different means, who don't have like a lot of overlapping history together and who are constantly reinforced like as like, oh, we're in a state of war. Oh, we're in a state of war. And war against the indigenous people of Palestine is what unites them. So I guess like, and maybe, and it's, we're talking for over an hour. I've kept it, I've kept you both. I'm sorry, but I have to ask this question. Is it that, like, let's say they got their wish. Let's say Zionists got their wish. The ultra Zionists got their wish. They did the thing of Thanos. He snapped his fingers and all the Palestinians went away one day. Their society would collapse in six months. I mean, forget, forget the material needs of Zionist, of like the Jewish Zionist project of requiring Palestinian labor. Let's forget about that. Let's say they fly in a hundred thousand, like hundreds of thousands of Thai workers, which like I imagine they would do in such a scenario. Is that like w there was nothing like the, without the feeling of superiority over Palestinians, like that image that like in the video we saw, like like of the woman just kind of there's like a, there's that woman kind of staring outwards, and you can kind of tell that like something's in her brain is clicking that like this is kind of wrong. But like, I mean, even if she's not saying that, there's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into that. But like, ultimately, like that scene is what brings them together more than anything else. The scene of terrorizing these defenseless mourners who, because they're mourning someone they don't like, that is is now they are a threat to them. So they have to like push over a Palestinian grandma. They have to destroy the tent. Like they have to go to such length. And I think that like sadism explains part of it. Yes. Like sadomasochism, sadomasochism is part of, I would say, yeah, like a, a key part, but it doesn't go all the way that it plays, I would say an underlying like national role for them. And in the way that like earlier we talked about like Palestinian Wataniya, right? Like cutting against these different polities, Zionism in a way, like they, they are that manifest. Right, like they have all these polities that are brought together and glued together, like a, you know, like a ball of rubber bands that like your mom would put together when you were a kid. That like if you just string them off together, you'll get like this hole. But like, honestly, like this, if the genocide has taught us anything, is that what unites them is their 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 need to triumph over Palestinians and to conquer them, like across the board right slavs europeans like people from brooklyn like whatever like across the class divide you know the uh north african like uh, you know like this whole this a uh, huge chunk of this of the jewish sector of zionist society needs palestinians there to to unite and if they didn't have i mean this is this is my running thesis i don't know if that's true maybe that's like a useless counterfactual because who like wants to who wants to think that way but i guess in some ways it's more about like in, to, in, you guys are conscripted. Palestinians have been conscripted into the Israeli National Identity Project. Like whether, like you weren't chosen to be, but you were. You're a key part of it. I think it's important that we we. I think yeah. I think it's important we take a step back, and we understand that Zionism is settler colonial, and we make a differentiation between Jewishness and Zionism. That's the first step we need to make, and so. What is settler colonialism? Settler colonialism is a project of destruction to replace, right? Destroy to replace. So it is about erasure of the people of the land from the land. That's what settler colonialism is. Zionist settler colonialism uses the mythology of Jewishness in order to give a, a, a rhetorical sort of guise or cover for this settler colonial violence. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize the use of that and the misuse and manipulation of that, right? That's the first thing you need to think about. The second is that I think it's important to understand in the same way that Walid was talking about psychological um, means of torture and manipulation is that it actually speaks more about he who uses those tools than he who is using them on, right? So I think you're right in the sense of the fact that they are... In, and the Zionism as an ideology and the Zionist state as an entity and its brutality and violence is confined to ever growing violence. 
right? And the violence is against the people of the land and erasure on the land. And the violence is also an internal kind of violence. And we see this play out in internal Israeli society. It is a society built on violence. It is a, an ideology built on it and a state built on it. And therefore it is connected and confined to this kind of violence. This ever growing, and it will, it will be constantly ever growing. I don't think we are conscripted as victims of this violence because I don't, because we are victims. I think it is it is a part a part as Abud was, has been saying part and parcel of Zionist ideology and the manifestation of that ideology in a state. I think that you I think that's it's important to understand that that's how settler colonialism functions, right? And then, and there is there is a conversation about settler colonialism in the various geographies, and a conversation about Zionist settler colonialism is that the demographic issue of the Palestinians who have remained, and those of us who have remained Palestinian, um, is, is a constant source of uh, insecurity for the settler state. They are, it is a fragile sense of nationalism, amongst of settler nationalism, and our very presence is, um, is, is a source of that insecurity. And I think one of the things that you see in the in the Oslo in the peace process is that we were asked, or certain Palestinians have been co-opted in the in the leadership, supposed leadership or alleged leadership, to um, to to manifest, you know, to to understand and and take that insecurity as a central access and process of what came thereafter. Those of us who are here that refuse to do that, and we are plenty and many, are the ones that. Abu was speaking about who do not live silently, nor do we die silently. So I think that kind of resistance is because of relationality to the land. And settler colonialism is about trying to, one, destroy that relationality and erase our presence. And, uh, and the ever-growing levels and intensity of violence speaks to their ever-growing insecurity and their inability to do that. That is a big picture, and it's something that I think is about, I think what Walid was talking about in his later works when he was writing to Milad, his unborn child, and later Milad, his child, is that the dream belongs to us and future belongs to us because another aspect of settler, settler colonial violence is to foreclose a future. And the idea of imagining tomorrow and imagining a future is in and of itself resisting settler colonialism. And so I think that scares the settler project. And so in real time, every day, that level of fragility, insecurity, and being scared amongst the, set, the violent settler state, state means it produces ever more intense levels of violence. But one of the things that one can discern from the ongoing genocide, the material genocide in Gaza, and the, um, what is called the slow and invisible genocide in the West Bank, I'm not sure that's what it is, um, is that the ever-growing intensity of violence means that there's an ever-growing fragility and insecurity in their own um, sense of being. And in the longer picture, that means that their future is, 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 uh, is, is more precarious, and they understand that. In the short term, that means that there will be ever-growing, there will be even more intense manifestations of this violence. Thinking about the future is also thinking about the fact that we are not conscripted into their into their scenario as much as we are a block on it. Um, but I do understand what you're saying is that any this the 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 eye of whiteness of their whiteness or their claimed whiteness is about controlling the other, and so obviously part of their part of part of their um, po political politics of settler colonialism is about controlling um, another population. But overall, the settler colonial um, enterprise is about erasing Palestinian presence on the land or indigenous presence in general. Um, and their inability, obviously, to do that means that there will be ever-growing um, manifestations of violence. Liberalism as a project didn't work amongst the Israelis. One can argue it wasn't it wasn't tried. There was never a liberal iteration of Zionism within the Israeli state, but the, what's going on now clearly is not that. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of, that was a response to what you were saying. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, look, uh, to complete on what Rana was saying, I think, and what Sina, you're asking, I mean, if we, we do look from the gaze of the settler, I mean, he does see the Palestine as a, as a, as a obstacle in a way, a threshold, somebody to be hunted, controlled, disappeared, um, you know, excluded from the land. Um, and you do point to something that is also intricate to Zionism is that how you do unite people who are desperate, um, come from different cultures and, and you, you create this imaginative community, uh, without, you know, uh, exalting and building up the enemy. And without this kind of frontier uh, politics that is always imbued, and I think my answer to you is that if Palestinians disappear, that will not be, you know, I don't think Zionism will confine itself to Palestine. Zionism will, you know, has this always the search for movement within space. And, you know, you saw Smotrich, for instance, having, um, you know, uh, in a conference, I think in Paris, the picture of Jordan um, alongside historic Palestine as the target. You know, like, um, I think that the, the imagination among many of the, let's say, more the spearhead of the Zionist movement now, the ultra-nationalist religious, uh, the grandsons of the Kahana movement, you know, is, is about this constant movement and expansion uh, 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 within space. Uh, I mean, and it, it harkens back actually to the 20th century and colonialism and also, you know, to a lot of the ideologies about how, you know, states are organic and have to like expand their boundaries and move into new spaces. Um, and, and in many ways that, that ideological uh, current within Israeli uh, uh, society is very manifest and very deep. So it will always have an enemy. It will always create the enemy. It will create the condition for enmity, even if Palestinians uh, give up or disappear or uh, God forbid, you know, we're all like killed or anything like that. I, I think that that does not mean that that's the end of, of you know, or the normalization of the state of Israel. Um, uh, it, it will just create more uh, enemies from amongst the people that surround it uh, uh, geographically. Now, having said that, I think, um, you know, I think what Nana was saying in terms of, you know, uh, the focus within Walid Dakka's um, work on, on the issue of future and perhaps about, you know, the whole uh, notion of um, you know, how future is foreclosed or how Zionism attempts, you know, like if we think about, for example, the Jabotinsky's Iron Wall, uh, which is this, you know, metaphoric uh, um, buildup of a wall that um, is imbued with such pure power that whenever Arabs or Palestinians try to infiltrate or crack, they will be met with a headache um, this policy of Zionist militarism that harkens back to this, this is a doctrine that will sustain an ethno-nationalist racist uh, state among, you know, uh, 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 Arab and Palestinian people and will dominate the region uh, in terms of its military power and capacity, that it needs this iron wall. In many ways, I think... Um, Walid's work is also an attempt to to crack open that wall. Um, uh, in in many of his literary works, and it is understanding to me at least that's how I interpret it, of resistance as an action that opens political possibilities, as a new beginning, if you want, um, like uh, you know uh, the way he named his uh, daughter Milad, which is uh, birth or um, is that in, in essence, Walid was also searching with his, his writing about these new births, these new beginnings, uh, beginnings that don't have necessarily, you know, uh, a, a concrete uh, end goal, uh, but the, the ability to imagine a horizon of, of liberation. And in these later literary works, we can see his, uh, you know, his assault on all the thinking that attempts to foreclose uh, the future within uh, Palestinian uh, uh, society and, you know, this uh, attachment to the child and his curiosity and ability to, to say the truth, but also 
to the child as a figure of a new beginning uh, uh, and uh, to the ability to determine our own future through our decisions and and will and i think you know um you know these later works which i think in many ways was his way of also leaving something behind uh, uh for his daughter um to read and to give the lessons uh of life perhaps uh, uh tell us about this combination of um you know the child or this this child that is in, within walid himself uh, this hopeful, uh, curious, uh, um, and uh, uh, a person who believes in the openness of time, uh, not in its, uh, you know, inevitability or foreclosed uh, futurity or the end of the future, like uh, many, at least in Palestinian society, um, cursed with um, the current political leadership of the PLO, think that defeat is eternal and should be remain uh, uh, or should remain eternal. I think if I can, if I can just pick dovetail onto what Abud was saying about defeat, I think it's important to sort of think about um, if we think about world making as a politics of imagination, Walid gave us and gives us the power of imagination, right? So he moves from understanding what mechanisms of psychological control were meant to do into showing how they didn't do that. So in in writing to Milad, he wrote birth writing to a child yet unborn in 2011. And here, if I can quote from that piece, um, and it's a quote that has been used a lot over the last week in celebrating Walid's imagination and what he gave us in that power. He wrote, do you think, my dear, that I have gone mad? writing a letter to a creature who has yet been born. Which one of us is mad? A nuclear state that fights a yet to be born child, deems them a security threat, or is it mad to dream of a child? Which one is madness? To write a letter to a dream or to have the dream become a file in the hands of Israeli intelligence. What do you think? Should I stop dreaming? I will continue to dream that despite the bitterness of reality, and I will search for meaning in life despite what I have lost of it. He wrote that in 2011. Milad, his daughter with Sanat, was born in 2020. So there is this notion of sort of dreaming um, and imagination as being the utter, you know, the utmost power of resistance that gives us this kind of notion that freedom is not a destination, but rather a practice and an evolving form. And it's evolving form that sort of anticipates um, and works to understand settler violence, but also overcomes it. Um, and it's really important to understand that as a huge and important sort of lesson of this, is that it's we work to understand settler violence, expose it, speak to it, speak truth to it, but not because we're confined by it or defined by it, but rather understanding it or working to have other people understand it means that we enable spaces for ourselves and create those spaces to imagine otherwise. And that's what Milad was and is for Walid. The, um, the story of her birth also is itself an act of resistance, right? Rana, can you tell us about it? Because they, they, they didn't, the Israelis didn't allow them to spend time together. No. Um, well, the story, it's a, it's a story of Walid and Sanat's love as well. I think that's what um, that's what a lot of us are holding on to. A lot of people are holding on to Sanat. The, the, the photo that you have that you're showing right now is um, a celebration in prison. Walid, Dakka, and Sanat um, married, and they you know, she they worked to try to be able to have time in prison, um, and they were denied that. Um, and then over time, Milad was made from um, a, a work of insurgency, right? Um, um, and in, <laughs> yeah, as I said, in, it's a, a form of insurgency um, and resisting captivity. Um, so Milad was born in 2020, and it was a long, hard fought fight to be able to, to, to create Milad. And she's a beautiful young um, child. And I think what's really beautiful is that Walid imagined her, you know, 
more than a decade before she was born. Um, and he has, there's a trilogy of short stories um, that were written about this journey and this odyssey. Um, there's the oil secret tale, the sword secret tale, and um, I guess it's an unfinished manuscript now, but it should, it, it will be finished perhaps in, I don't know what finished means here. Um, it's the spirit secret tale. Uh, martyrdom, martyrs return to Ramallah. And um, all three of those are in a lot of ways what Walid was writing about. He, he wrote to liberate himself from prison. And part of that liberation was talking about this journey of birth and imagining life and then enacting that imagination into creating life. Um, and that's about a future. And it's born of love. And I think Walid wrote often about how, and so did, and Sanat did as well, um, wrote and spoke often about how it's an odyssey and a tale of love, um, which is how a lot of us choose to see Walid and Sanat, which is, I think, part of what's so devastating about, as you described earlier, his murder and perhaps can provide solace for us in, the, in that his imagination lives beyond his body. Thank you, Rana. That was um, that was really that was really moving. And thank you to both of you, Aboud, Rana. This was um, a fantastic conversation. I've kept you guys for almost for over an hour and a half. Um, I'm sure it's almost it's it's in it's evening over there in Palestine. Um, I guess I guess at the close. Um, oh yeah. At the close, I guess um, maybe uh, I don't know. No, I mean, it's, I, I guess the the other thing is that like the, the I wanted to talk about the 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 eight thousand hostages, right? That that Israel has taken just in these eight in these in these six months, right? And then that adds to the tally that they already had before then. And I guess in some ways, you know, what maybe very quickly because it is late, but what comes next for like the Palestinian like liberate like prisoner struggle specifically, because he was one of the he was one of the sort of leaders of it, and his extent the extension of his sentence was done because of his activism, but also just the torture. I think it's important to Walid's voice. Again, the past tense is hard. Walid's voice is and will continue to be a voice of wisdom and hope. But his voice is also one of many. So um, the struggle continues. Um, and it's important for your audiences, I think, to recognize um, that Walid's writing is, uh, and writings and his intellectual and, 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 and the journey that he shared with us is extraordinary. But we have, in the Palestinian context, um, you know, again, Prisoners and incarceration is an interesting term, and we'll need ask us to nuance that. But we have people that we turn to and read. We have Basim Khandakji, who continues to write from in, in, from prison. We have Marwan al Barghouti and Ahmed Sardat, who themselves continue to offer, both in terms of leadership and in terms of their writing. Um, in December, Khaled al Jarrar was arrested on December 26, but Shortly thereafter, a piece of hers was published, and she, in that piece, she was advocating for the dismantlement of prison. She was advocating for this moment as a moment of liberation and understanding that liberating prisoners and the dismantlement of the carceral state is about Palestinian liberation and emancipatory practice. Walid's voice inspired many, um, and his is one of many voices as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I I I echo and what uh, Rana was saying in terms of Walid being uh, a voice for many, and the struggle continues within the prisons. Perhaps um, I'll just say, you know, after seventh of October, uh, what actually Walid was writing about in molding the consciousness, not to take back the conversation there, but um, you know, was talking about this kind of liquid modernity and the techniques of torture that comes with it. But since 7th of October, we have seen this kind of monstrosity that is also part of like, if we want uh, the logic of modernity overall, 
that has also manifested in Palestinian prisons. Um, um, you know, the long fought struggle of Palestinian prisoners, for example, to, you know, gain some specific, you know, daily rights within the prisons. Um, a lot of it has been taken away at this current moment. Um, you know, we've, we've been hearing a lot of brutal stories about how Palestinian prisoners are confined, brutalized, um, um, you know, uh, left uh, uh, under cuffs uh, without uh, many of the basic conditions, including the ability to for haircuts or even showering or, you know, eating proper food. I mean, the prisons have been a site also of a struggle since 7th of October and hasn't been talked about, not to mention these special prisons that Israel has created um, uh, for uh, those in prisons in the Gaza Strip. Um, and they include what we're hearing is even more horrific stories about, you know, uh, clutches being placed on people's hands. And then because of their tightness, people have to amputate their arms, as some of the reports on Haaretz have uh, have already uh, claimed, and there's been a lot of prisoners that have also been uh, killed by Israel uh, in in the past six months, uh, adding to the more than 200, I think, and 50 prisoners that were killed historically in these prisons. And in fact, one of uh, Walid's own comrades uh, within the cell he operated with, Ibrahim Rai, he was also tortured to death in in, in prison um, uh, in the 1980s. So um, just to point out that at this current moment, the prisons are a site of, 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 of horrendous forms of practices being uh, this, uh, you know, sat, uh, sadism uh, that we've been talking about that have been practiced uh, in the prisons for the past six months and remain so, including expanding the arrest profile of, of those people that Israel has arrested and increasing their numbers. But again, I mean, I think the prisons right now are also hopeful, um, hopeful that, uh, you know, there will be some sort of prisoners exchange. They're also hopeful that the current moment, the current practice that emanated from October 7th, uh, this attempt to break through the prison walls of Gaza um, and attempt to create a new political horizon will uh, will also expand our ability to think uh, of a future uh, without a prison and and without all these forms of uh, and practices of oppression that have befallen Palestine for a century now. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, Abu. This was a great conversation, and um, I'm going to include links to those articles. And um, yeah, thank you so much.